Welcome to the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Joseph Stewart. Derwin Gray, a BYU alumni and pastor of Transformation Church in South Carolina, says that part of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that the Savior has a lot to say about how to heal our persistent racial divides. In his new book, How to Heal Our Racial Divide, What the Bible Says and the First Christians Knew About Racial Reconciliation, Pastor Gray shows us how knowing the heart of God helps us to see each person as a creation of a loving God. And from the beginning, God envisioned a reconciled multi-ethnic family in loving communities, reflecting God's beauty and healing presence in the world. The message is central to the gospel itself, he argues. Here are Pastor Derwin Gray and Vicki Gray. Vicki and Derwin Gray, welcome to the Max Maxwell Institute Podcast. Thank you. It's an honor for us Thank to be you. here. The pleasure is all ours, as is the honor. And love that you all are here, especially talking about Derwin's new book, How to Heal Our Racial Divide what the Bible says and the first Christians knew about racial reconciliation. And both of you are BYU alumni. I was curious, did you all meet here at BYU? We did meet at BYU, and my wife is valedictorian here at Brigham Young University. So I think it's very important for everybody to know. And she was on the track team. I want her to give her version of how we met, and then I'll give the true version of how we met. The true version. Okay. Yeah. So it was my junior year. It was his freshman year, second semester. And I was in the athlete's weight room and I was doing an exercise called tricep extensions. And there was hardly anybody in the weight room and I needed a spot. And so I spotted him and asked him if he would give me a spot. And he said, sure. So he did. And then I bolted after that. Maybe a couple of weeks later, we were both playing basketball. It was actually Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, and a lot of the athletes would play pickup basketball on like off days just to get a workout in and have fun. And so we were playing basketball, and he asked one of his teammates on the football team to ask me if he could talk to me because he was so brave. And so I was like, sure, because I thought he was cute. And so we sat up on the bleachers in the Smith Fieldhouse. And he asked me if I had a boyfriend. I said, I did, but I'd love to be friends, which I'm sure he was like, okay, yeah, great. But he was still very kind. And then it was probably a couple of weeks later, we ran into each other in the hallway in the Smithfield house. And he said, you still got that boyfriend? And I was like, nope. And so we exchanged numbers. And I think we went to a dance that used to be called UVCC back in the day. We went to a dance there that night, and we've been together ever since, and that was 1990. You know, that was a very, very accurate portrayal of what happened. But let me just color in some of the missing spot. I saw her playing basketball, but what I was impressed with is she was like throwing elbows at guys and dropping threes, playing defense. And I grew up as a compulsive stutterer, so I thought, you know, it's better if I ask my teammate to ask her if I could talk to her. That's how we met, and we've been together like ever since. And when you think about it, for us to meet on Dr. King's birthday, in essence, January 15th, 1990, two non-LDS student athletes, neither one of us were people of faith. Like We really didn't know. We didn't go to church. We didn't pray. But two non-LDS athletes, black kid from San Antonio, white girl from Montana, and we meet at BYU on Dr. King's birthday, and now We lead a church that is intentionally Jesus centered and a multi ethnic church. Like we are literally living out Dr. King's dream. And all due respect to Dr. King, I am quite sure that he got his dream from the King of Kings because King Jesus in Revelation 5 9, we see every nation, tribe, and tongue surrounding his throne saying, Worthy is the Lamb of God. Absolutely. And the creation of that beloved community. It's beloved because it is led by the beloved. Amen. I am curious about is that both of you, as you said, were student athletes. What is it like being non-Latter-day Saint, alumni BYU who are athletes? What sort of questions do you get asked by friends or community neighbors about BYU? Oh, yeah. So, So we're several years from when we were here, right? So a long, long time ago. I think what I get a lot of times is people will ask me, well, what do they believe in? Why do they believe what they believe? And both my wife and I made a commitment in the early 2000s to really study 
LDS history and LDS theology because my sister-in-law is a Latter-day Saint, Vicky's dad is Latter-day Saint, and, and so many of my friends. And so the better you understand people, the less fear. And so people ask us, well, what are you saying to them? Like, how are you setting them straight? And it's one of these things is I can love you without agreeing with everything. I can be present among you and say, this is who I am, why I am, and let's find common ground. But early on, when I first started speaking, like in 1999, I would speak at various youth events and church events around the country. And when people found out I went to BYU, they would go, are you Mormon? And I was like, well, you do know none Mormons can go to BYU, right? Folks do not know that. <laughs> and then the next question, they go, did you go on a mission? I'm like, well, no, I did not go on a mission then. So I would explain LDS culture and what a missionary was and those types of things. And so, you know, I think for the most part, people are curious and they want to know like, man, you guys cook. So you're not Latter-day Saints, but yet you get to do all this stuff there. Why is that? I said, well, think is because people see that we genuinely love Christ. We genuinely love people. And the school's been good to us. I would say one of the things that's it's different because so growing up in Montana and then living in Utah for six years, I'm obviously more rooted historically in a Western culture. And we know the Intermountain West, the Northwest, even like the Arizona, Southern California, there's like a heavy LDS population. So it was very normative. Even growing up in Montana, I had more friends probably who were Mormon than who weren't. In the Southeast, what we have found is that there's actually a lot of people that don't really aren't as familiar with the LDS faith. A lot of them won't even think anything of it. They'll be like, what's BYU? You know? And so we do get a broad spectrum of responses. You have some people who, as Darwin said, are a little bit maybe harsh. Like, well, why would you go there? Like, why would you talk to them? What, you know, almost in a, a fearful, almost like, Christ against the culture approach, like almost like attacking. And we also have people that sometimes when they go onto our website for our church, it says that we went to BYU, who will occasionally get an email or someone will ask like, hey, before I get serious about your church, I need to know, are you Mormon? Like, did you go to be, why did you go to be, what are your beliefs? And so if anything, it's strengthened our faith it's also strengthened and encouraged our love and passion to love people of the Mormon faith, you know, and that it's so important that we just exhibit love because it's God's love that changes you no matter what faith tradition you claim. Amen. Well, and I was just going to add to that. And I love when she does that. She's just, she just riffs. It's awesome. <laughs> the idea is that I have to agree with everything for me to love you is foreign to the New Testament. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbors. You love yourself. You agreeing with me on everything is not a requirement for me to love you with everything in me. And so we actually love the engagement. There's a lot that we love about LDS culture. And so in studying LDS theology and culture, it's actually helped me grow in my faith as a Protestant. People will go, well, what are you? I go, well, we are a New Testament church that is rooted in Jesus, shaped by his gospel, that adheres to the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, is that we don't want to be an institution. We want to be a movement. And we believe that the church is individuals who say Jesus is Lord. They've been blood washed. And I think the other thing that's really important, and you know, the last four to six years, just culturally in America, it's become much more maybe the word is rare, to have respectful dialogue with people you disagree with. And of course, I'm referring more to like the political spectrum, but I think even the way we operate, we want to model that you still love people who are different than you and that loving someone doesn't mean you agree with everything they think, everything they do. I mean, that would almost be impossible, right? And so I think even us coming to BYU regularly it's an opportunity for us to model, like, this is how you love people that believe differently than you. Well, and I love that. It's something also that struck me in diving into your book, which again is called How to Heal Our Racial Divide, What the Bible Says and the First Christians Knew About Racial Reconciliation. You mentioned 
that neither one of you really attended church while you were at BYU. You didn't necessarily identify as strong Christians. Darwin, when did that change for you? When I was here, football was my God. And idolatry is finding your mission and purpose and significance and identity in anything other than Jesus. And so for me, that's what football done for me. And so everything was going great. I mean, I came here, I became a superstar my sophomore year. People love me. I met my dream. I mean, it was just great. I mean, every list of accomplishment, it was check, 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 check. Then in 1993, I get to the NFL and this is like, okay, this is it. I'm going to be able to get rich. I'm going to help my family in Texas. All my dreams are going to come true. And then three years in, I'm a team captain. It's 1995. And it's like this existential crisis. It's like, wait a minute. Despite the nice clothes that you can buy now, your soul is still dressed shabby. You live with bitterness. You live with anger. You can't forgive your dad. You've got family trauma. Even though I couldn't say it then, but literally when I would fly home to Texas, the pilot would announce that we're getting ready to land. My face would start to twitch. I mean, it was just a trauma response that I didn't even know that that's what it was. I knew there were things I needed forgiveness for. And no matter how many good things I did, it wasn't enough. I tried. It wasn't enough. And then the last straw was who would I be after playing in the NFL? Because the NFL stands for not for long. So who are you when you can't do what you build your life on? And so I had a teammate named Steve Grant. His nickname was the Naked Preacher. And so every day after practice, he would take a shower, dry off, wrap a towel around his waist. Steve was 6'2", 240 pounds, white towel wrapped around his waist, and he'd get his Bible and he'd go to my teammates and he'd ask them this. He'd say, do you know Jesus? And in my mind, I'm like, do you know you're half naked? I mean, it was just strange. So I asked the veterans on the team, I was like, what's up with the half naked black man walking around talking about, do you know Jesus? And they said, don't pay no attention to him. That's the naked preacher. Well, one day in 1993, I'm sitting in my locker and he comes to me and he asked me a question that changed my life. He said, do you know Jesus? And like most people who don't know Jesus, my response was, well, I'm a good person. And he said, compared to who? That's a question with a lot of weight. To it. Yeah. Like he, he, he said, compared to who? Because he goes, well, the Bible says that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, Jesus himself is the glory of God. So Jesus is the standard by which we judge. And based on that standard, no one is good. Romans 3. 10. And that began to get the wheel spinning because I had prided myself on, I'm the first person to graduate in my family. I don't have children outside of wedlock. I'm getting my education. I was very prideful in Derwin Gray. And grace, grace eradicates any sense of accomplishment or earning or worthiness. But it was a five-year process that ultimately I started getting injured I started recognizing that I didn't know how to love her because I didn't know how to love myself. And on August 2nd, 1997, it was training camp fifth year with the Colts. We were in Anderson, Indiana at Anderson University. It was after lunchtime and I was walking back to my dorm and I just sensed like just this chasm in my soul. That's the best way I could. It was like my soul was divided. I went back to my dorm room and I called her on the phone and I said, I want to be more committed to you. And I want to be committed to Jesus. And I knew when I was born again, like it was like the divine love of Jesus just in buckets and buckets of grace just fell on me. And for three nights, I just, I just cried. I was overwhelmed with this thought. How could someone like Jesus love somebody like me? Now I understand Jesus loves somebody like me is because somebody like me is all that Jesus has to love that we're all in the same boat and we all need grace. And so that's when I fell in love with Jesus and the symptoms of his love have only increased. So Vicky, I'm curious, how did you react when you received that phone call and how did you come to receive your own Christian witness? Yeah. So I'll start with how did I receive that phone call? I was happy and I was encouraged, not in the sense that I fully understood what was happening, but I was probably maybe about six months ahead of him on my journey. It's kind of funny looking back now because all I was praying was for him to feel what I felt. I didn't have words for it. So when I was at BYU, you know, he will say his God, his idol was football. And mine was 
performance and achievement. And so growing up, my parents divorced when I was young and my dad, when he got remarried, he married a woman in the LDS faith. And so I was exposed to the LDS faith at a very early age. But when I came to BYU, I was really only interested in one thing, and that was in being the best at everything I did, because my value, my purpose, my significance, my identity, everything was found in what I could accomplish. And so I really wasn't interested, not just in the LDS faith, I wasn't really interested in any faith. My faith was in me, Vicki Ensign. That's what my faith was in which now I laugh about when you think about like how fallible we are as humans, right? But I had achieved a lot before I got to BYU. And so that's where I got my affirmation. And so when we got to BYU, well, I was here two years before him and and I really struggled my first couple of years here. And I think part of it was because coming to BYU, you know, you're an institution with, I think at the time it was maybe 30,000 full-time students. and you don't get into BYU by being a slouch. So now all of a sudden, I'm the little fish in the big pond. And that proposes a big challenge when you find your value and your significance in your achievements. And so it took me a couple years to get my footing. And by my junior year, which was the year we met, I had a really good year in track and field. So I threw the javelin. And that year, I was 18th in the nation. And I was disappointed because only the top 12 at that time went to nationals and I was 18th. And so I missed it by six and that was my goal. And so now I look back and I'm like, that's amazing (laughs) that I did that. But at that time, I viewed it as failure. You know, I didn't achieve. But by that point, I had met, I'll call him Dewey because that's what a lot of people here know him as. I met Dewey and we just became best friends like immediately. And so I think for a time, you know, that was sort of, I don't want to use the word distraction in a negative sense, but I wasn't as concerned about the achievement or even kind of the inner turmoil that was going on in my own soul. Because it was, I think probably before him, I had started on this path and it was probably more after we got married because we did get married here at BYU while we were, we both still had a year of school left. and. There was something going on inside me that I like knew that there had to be a reckoning. I can't explain why other than the Bible says that it's written on our hearts that that we know. And I just knew that I had done things I needed to be forgiven of, that there were things that were done to me that I needed healing from. And I was seeking. I wouldn't have probably used that term then. So fast forward, we get to the NFL and I think I like to say God set us up because we thought that would be like the pinnacle. Like we thought, yes, when we get there, like, I don't know, you suddenly think everything's going to be great, you know? And we were really disappointed. We wanted to come back to BYU. We're like, let's go home. And so I think in his love for us, God let us experience, this is what you thought was going to give you joy and purpose and happiness. And it's empty, isn't it? And I probably hit that bump six months to a year before he did. I was working as a registered dietitian in an inner city health clinic in downtown Indianapolis. And I was struggling again with now I'm not even known as Vicki Ensign, the javelin thrower, the girl that's number one in the class or whatever. Now I'm known as that's Doran Gray's wife. Well, at the time, that was hard for me because, again, my God was my achievement. And so my achievement is I'm his wife. Now, like, that's an honor to me, right? Then I was like, but I'm more than that. And so during that time while I was working at that health clinic, there was another dietitian that I worked with. Her name was Karen. And I used to come home and tell Dewey, I'd be like, there's this lady at work and she's a really good Christian. Because, and the reason I would say that is because I thought I was a Christian, but that's because I wasn't Mormon or I wasn't Buddhist or I wasn't Hindu and I'm an American. So I believed in God and I would say to him, she's a really good Christian because she doesn't cuss and she doesn't drink. But what's interesting is she graciously just befriended me 
And she saw that there was something going on inside me. She saw God working on me. And one day I asked her a question over coffee. We were sitting there and I said, so do you believe in demons? And I know that's kind of a scary thing to ask, but you know, when you're completely lost, you're like kind of wrestling with what does this look like? I asked her that and she, you know, she said, yes, you know, demons are real. And, and then she said, well, are you a Christian? And I was like, yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. And she just very lovingly, patiently and kindly said, wow, being a Christian is more than believing in God. Being a Christian means that you understand that Jesus died for your sins because you can't be perfect and your righteousness can't match the righteousness of a holy God. So Jesus, he substitutes himself for you. And I remember her saying that, and I probably just had a glazed over look because I was like, that's interesting, but I mean, I don't really understand. So she said, she wrote down some scriptures and she said, go home and read these and just, you know, spend some time talking to God about them. And that was really the beginning part of my understanding what it meant to walk with Christ. And so, like I said, I was about six months ahead of him when that process started. I just love these examples that you both shared that it's God's leading you, that is helping you to reprioritize. It's not just uh, changing your life. It's recognizing the things that, that matter most and recognizing that grace that's come into your life. I think that many listeners will recognize that time when you realize, I cannot do this by myself. I cannot heal myself. I need to rely on the Savior to do that. Something I love in your book is that you write about race and reconciliation as a Jesus issue. And Absolutely. You, and you see race and reconciliation, especially in the story of Abraham. Yeah. So I think looking at the big meta narrative, right? And one of the things that I say often to the congregation of Transformation Church is this if you don't know God's story, you're going to try to put God in your story. And Jesus does not play co star to anyone. And so in God's story, we know in the Garden of Eden, there was this epic fall where this horrible disease of sin and death and evil enter creation. Uh, God is a passionate father who pursues his children. We get to Genesis 11 and we find God's children, God's people building these temples in essence and a pathway for the gods to come down. So once again, it's idolatry, it's oppression of those building the temples and God disperses them. Genesis 11. In Genesis 12, something beautiful takes place. God calls a man by the name of Abram and in essence changes his name to Abraham, which means father of many. And he says, Abraham, through you, I'm going to make this covenant with you, this, this one-way love. All you got to do is trust me. I'm going to do the heavy lifting. You just trust me. And in essence, he says, I'm going to make you a great nation of all the nations. And so there's this vision that God the Father loves all of his children, and he's going to use Abraham to create this multi-ethnic family. So we get Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and ultimately, the nation of Israel, and as the book of Isaiah says, the nation of Israel existed to be a light to the Gentiles, to the Gonim, to the non-Jews. And so the way they were to live following Torah with their distinct way of festivals and kosher and circumcision was to be a light to say, this is what it looks like with God. Well, Israel failed in that, but there's whispers of a Hamashiach, a Messiah, a Christ to come. And this Christ, according to the book of Daniel, would be divine and eternal. And he would come and be a savior. And the book of Isaiah talks about what he would do. And eventually, Jesus of Nazareth comes. And Jesus of Nazareth is in his humanity the prototype of what Adam and Eve were to be and what we were to be. He comes and he lives a sinless life, fulfilling all of the Ten Commandments because we could not. He becomes the sacrificial lamb and pass over. He liberates us from the power of sin, death, and evil and forgives us and declares us righteous, substitutes himself. He raises again on the third day to vindicate that he is the Messiah. He ascends to the right hand of the Father and the Holy Spirit is sent to indwell God's people that instead of building quote unquote temples, they would be the living temple housing his presence. And his presence would be in every nation, tribe, and tongue. And so the idea of racial reconciliation being 
an addition to or secular psychology or sociology is foreign. It is deeply, deeply rooted in the Bible. If you go to Ephesians 2.12 and it talks about the covenant of promise, and then you go to Ephesians 2.14 through 16, where it says that Christ is our peace. He tore down the dividing wall. He removed hostility. He took Jews and Gentiles and he made them one new humanity. And it's this beautiful portrait that Jesus not only comes to forgive our sins, but to create a family with different colored skins. And through the Spirit's power, as we love each other, the world will know that not only are we his disciples, but our unity will to declare to the world that the Father did indeed send him. So this issue is at the core of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And if I could add this, and this is so important, and I've had to start doing this particularly about the last five to six years, is how would you live your faith if Republican and Democratic political categories didn't exist? Because overwhelmingly, historically, that's how followers of Jesus have lived. And the overwhelming followers of Jesus in the world are not limited by Democrat or Republican politics. And so what I've tried to do in the Bible is really draw people to the ancient reality of the early church, that this is not a CRT issue. This is not a social. No, this is a gospel issue. This is a gospel issue that the good news is there is a new king and in his kingdom, he's invited people of every nation, tribe, and tongue by grace through faith in him to participate in this kingdom, to be his hands and his feet, to be the body of Christ. So God's greatest goal is not simply to get us heaven when we die, but to bring his heavenly kingdom to earth as he expresses himself through his multicolored people. Absolutely. And I love that you focus on Jesus as a barrier breaker. He's not only filling the breach that is left when we sin, that chasm between God and, and us, but he is also creating ways for us to break barriers between each other that we can experience grace together. And I'm thinking, especially in the book of Acts, when Peter receives the revelation that the gospel should go to all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, mm -hmm. and that doesn't seem to go over particularly well. I'm wondering if you've had some time to reflect on that and think about, it seems that Christians in all days, times, and places have had problems with accepting all of God's creatures as one of their own. Would yeah. you say that's fair? Absolutely, it's fair. Demonic powers love to divide. God's power loves to unite. So in 2017, my final class for my doctoral work was we went to Israel. And so we're going to Israel. And as a part of the trip, we were in Haffa. And there's a big old statue of a giant fish. And this is like Jonah, right? And I was talking to my professor, Scott McKnight. He is my doctoral advisor, world-renowned New Testament scholar. And I said, this is interesting. Okay, so Joppa is where the prophet Jonah was. And he didn't want to go to the Gentile Ninevites because he goes, you would be merciful to them. I don't want to go. So Jonah was a nationalist. He wanted Israel first. He was ethnocentric. He didn't want the godless to meet God. He didn't want to go. So God had to throw him overboard, put him in the belly of a well for him to get it, right? But Jaffa is also the same place that Peter was. And Peter is actually recapitulating or rewriting the story of Jonah. But Peter was also resistant. Three times the Lord had to tell him, kill and eat. And he's rebuking God again. Peter had a bad habit of rebuking Jesus. Three times. Three times. He did it. Nope. Uh, they're not going to crucify you. Nope. And he's like, well, homie, let me tell you something. You're actually going to deny me. So here's Peter again, telling God what God needs to do. And ultimately he finally believes God and he goes and he enters Cornelius's house. And in essence, in Acts 10, 28 through 32, he tells Cornelius, he's like, yo, I'm not even supposed to be in your house because it's unlawful for us Jews to be with you Gentiles. But God has shown me there is no favoritism at the foot of the cross and at the entrance of the empty tomb into God's kingdom. All of God's people stand in the supremacy of Christ and Christ alone. Now, 
before I get to the example, I had to lay the theology. So in Galatians chapter two, the same Peter who is like, man, you Gentiles, you're equal. God's grace. We're family. He's in a city called Antioch and Antioch is going great. Jews and Gentiles, enemies, friends, foes, family. Jesus is doing this new thing. And Peter is eating with the Gentiles in the first century world to eat with someone meant you accepted him. So Peter is eating with the Gentiles. He's eating bacon wrapped shrimp. He's eating hog malls. He's eating pork chops. I mean, this guy is like, man, you Gentiles can eat. But then Galatians 2.11 says, and the party of James came to town. And Peter, afraid of their criticism, gets up from the table with the Gentiles and goes with the Jews. Galatians 2.13 says something like this. Peter's hypocrisy even made Barnabas get up. The name Barnabas, Bar means son, Abbas. Barnabas is like the son of encouragement. Barnabas, I mean, like he's always happy. Barnabas was the one who went and got the apostle Paul and brought him to Antioch so Paul could learn multi-ethnic ministry. So my point in, in saying, saying that is this, in healing this racial divide through the gospel, even those who have experienced God's grace are going to need patience, but they're also going to need pushing. And that's where this upstart Paul stands up and says, Peter, what you're doing is out of step with the gospel. If you'd give me a moment and I want to bear down on this, I want to anchor down on this reconciliation flows into loving your neighbors. You love yourself. This is a gospel issue. One translation says you're deviating from the gospel. And Paul, the former church persecutor, stands up to Peter and says, what you're doing is wrong. Now, lastly, where did Paul get the courage from? Galatians 2.20 says this, I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Though I live in the body, it's by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul's power to not be a racist, but to become a gracious was rooted in Christ in him. So we need more of Christ in us to stand up and say, that's deviating from the gospel. And yes, we personally have experienced the emails. We've experienced people saying, why do you talk about race so much? And we go, because the Bible does. You know, people will say, every time, pastor, you talk about race, I'm sure your wife must get tired of it when you pull out the race card. But that's small potatoes compared to what like Jesus experienced and what the apostle Paul experienced. And so, yeah, anyway. I think this brings up an interesting point, Vicky, which is that you are a white woman and Derwin is an African-American and interracial relationships is not something that have always been accepted in the United States and not in Christianity. As a Christian, what's your response to the idea that you would be tired of someone pulling out the race card that you wouldn't agree with what your husband is saying? Well, it's hard for me to not laugh about it in a way. Because we've been married for 30 years. We've been together for 32 years. And, and I'm well aware of his skin color and my skin color. And so I think really, you know, what comes out of someone's mouth reveals what's in their heart. And so in my mind, it makes me think, well, wh what's your marriage like if you know what I mean? Because I'm like, well, we're on one accord with this. And the way somebody looks, their skin color. So like in the first century, ethnicity was determined more by religious practice, not skin color, right? America is very different in that really skin color is what we look at to judge ethnicity. And so we are very much on the same page as it relates to this, to our theology. I'm getting my master's now as well. And everything we do, we do on one accord. And I think Ultimately, what's most important, even in planting Transformation Church, that's the church we lead, we always start theologically. We never start sociologically. Okay. And so you have to start with the theology of who God is and who we are as his creations, right? And if you start sociologically, that's when you start getting into like political movements. And so that's never going to last. And so we, from a very early beginning, we were like, we want Transformation Church be built on theology. 
So Transformation Church, our vision is to be a multi-ethnic, multi-generational, mission-shaped community that loves God completely upward, loves ourselves correctly inward, and loves our neighbors compassionately outward. And that vision comes directly from the mouth of Jesus in the sense it comes from the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. The Great Commandment is, Jesus says, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you should love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so that's where we get the upward, inward, outward. I grow in loving God as I recognize how much he's loved me. His love transforms me. And I learn to see myself correctly. I learn to love myself correctly, not in a prideful way, but in a way that says, wow, he thinks I'm valuable, so valuable. He died for me so I can treat myself as valuable. That doesn't lead to conceit. It actually leads to humility and that overwhelming sense of his grace. Then learning to love yourself correctly allows you and empowers you to love others compassionately. So that's where we get the upward, inward, outward. The other component is from the Great Commission. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. The word nations there is actually comes from the word ethnos, which means ethnic groups. So it doesn't mean make disciples of all countries. It's make disciples of all people from every ethnicity. So not just across the sea, but across the street. And so that's where we get the vision of Transformation Church. And this is something we do on one accord. And you best believe God has taken us through some things in 30 years to make sure we are on one page with what he wants to do in our lives. Yeah. And also what, and my wife eloquently rolled it out, which is awesome. I have a justice streak that runs so deep within me and growing up in Montana on like around Native American reservations and just, I get very passionate when I see injustice done against anybody. Yeah, I'm the teddy bear yes. of us two. So back in when I was playing with the cults, this is about 1996, 1997-ish, there was a racial incident that took place at the University of Indiana. So they asked some of the black cult players to come up and, and speak. So anyway, on our way back, one of my teammates who loves the Lord, he's African-American, and we're, we're just having casual conversation about life. and. And he was like, yeah, man. He goes, man, when, when, when I first met you, I was like, why is he married to this white girl? Like, what's up with that? And I was in the back seat and I literally said, huh, Vicky is white, isn't she? And he just got really quiet and he goes, man, I repent. He goes, man, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, like I repent. I mean, I had no idea. I just said, huh, she is white because it was never like, oh, I like her because she's white. I was attracted to everything about her. I mean, the woman taught me how to study right across the street of the campus here at BYU. She taught me as a freshman. She said, hey, come over here. We're going to go to Exxon. We're going to get you a gas card. And we're going to build your credit because every month you're going to get gas and you're going to pay it off. She was so organized and detailed and strong and focused. And I was attracted to that. And she's 10 times even that now. And so we're very much well aware of our ethnicities. One thing that I want to be biblical about, right, is there's only one race, the human race, but the human race is comprised of multiple ethnicities, which deals with culture and language and symbols and time and shared story. So we're not in a inner racial marriage. We're in a inner ethnic marriage. But our ethnicities don't drive us. Christ drives us through our ethnicities. Like we've learned so much from each other. And like going to Montana, like my eyes were open to the suffering of Native Americans. I had no idea. I had no idea. I thought I grew up poor. And so there's some things that my daughter and I do on July 4th when we're in Montana. We go up to R. Lee. And we celebrate an epic powwow with the Salish Kootenai people up there. And it's, and it's utterly beautiful. Like we appreciate their culture. And so the Lord knew exactly what he was doing when he said, go make disciples of all nations. He was telling Jewish people, go to the Gentiles. By the way, the Gentiles for 400 years in Egypt held you as slaves. The Canaanites, the Hittites, the Zebuvites, all of them tried to destroy you. 
the Babylonians. Haman tried to eradicate, hate you. Now the Romans are oppressing you. So I want you to go to your enemy and I want you to love them unto me through you. And so this is what discipleship is. Discipleship isn't I've learned more information about scripture. Because in John 5, 39, the Pharisees, to be a Pharisee by the age of 12, you had to know the Tanakh from Genesis to Revelation, not word for word, but you had to be grounded in it. So Jesus tells the Pharisees, he goes in John 5, 39, you pour over the scriptures daily because you think in them is eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. Isn't it sad you could be so religious that Jesus is staring you right in the face and you miss him? Yeah. I think one of the things that, because I oversee discipleship at our church, and one of the things that we talk about is often you can see somebody's spiritual maturity by how they identify first. So before I'm a white female, I am a Christian. I belong to Jesus. Before I am anything else, before I'm a wife, before I'm a mother, I am of the Christian race. It's a new race of grace, and I belong to that race. And so, off and Dewey, as our lead pastor, he will often gets emails when people will say, you know, why are you, why are you talking about race so much? But what he challenges our people to understand is just what he would say about himself. Before he's a black man, he is. A Christian. So before you're a Republican or a Democrat or whatever you are, your primary identity is going to determine how you see yourself and how you see and treat other people. And so if we see ourselves first as anything other than Christ followers, that's going to impact the way we see people and the way we treat people. Let the church say amen. So Dewey, I really appreciated in the op-ed that you wrote for the Deseret News a few weeks ago. You wrote, people of faith in particular should be held to a higher standard when it comes to fighting racism and prejudice. Anyone who says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. The first epistle of John says, for the person who does not love his brother or sister, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. That, to me, requires a lot of courage, the courage to love, as as Dr. King wrote about so eloquently. How can Christians broadly, and maybe Latter-day Saints in particular, show that courage in leading out and rooting out racism. Yeah. Let's lay the foundation. Let's work with definitions, okay? Prejudice is individual. So prejudice can affect any type of people, right? I could be prejudiced and you could be. It is very individualistic. Racism deals more with one particular group having the most power in shaping that culture to its own ends. So, for example, growing up as a kid, when I went to elementary school, I had no problem writing because all of the deaths were made for right handed people. Well, I had friends who were left handed and it was really hard for them to write. But I didn't really think about it because I'm like, it ain't a problem for me. Well, it wasn't a problem because the desk was for right handed people, people who were left handed still were able to write, but it was harder for them. Racism deals with creating a society for only right-handed people, but there's left-handed people. So it's like you have right privilege. And when you're right-handed, if you don't think about, well, man, that's hard for them to write. Why don't we get desk for left-handed people too? Now, it's not my problem, but that is my brother. That is my sister. That is someone made in the image of God. Therefore, I want to see them flourish. So let's get some left-handed deaths, right? So racism deals more with power structures. The harder individual prejudice is easier to see than systemic. And theologically, every human being that's born is born broken. We, We need to be saved or there would be no need for Jesus. We need to be made to be born again. As Christians, we should care about human flourishing at every single level. The way that we show courage, number number one is this, is is particularly for my Latter-day Saint brothers and sisters. Be passionate about Jesus 
and his grace. That love that transforms you. And when you taste that kind of grace, you want to look and go, okay, if there's injustice, Jesus cares about justice. That's why he fed hungry people. That's why he was around the outcasts. And Jesus was also ostracized. He was called a drunkard and a glutton. Those are some fighting words in the first century to be called a drunkard and a glutton. But notice it was the religious establishment that called him those things. Jesus displayed courageous love. I mean, are you kidding me? He took his disciples to Samaria. There was a 700 ethnic feud between Jews and Samaritans. So it starts with the deeper I know the love of Christ, the more courageous I am to advocate for people. But you have to get in relationship with people. Proximity breeds intimacy. One of the things that we found at our church, so our church is probably 55% white, maybe a tad bit higher. But at times, white people will uh, adopt black kids, and that's awesome, and it's beautiful. One of the things that they'll say is, when our boys were small, everybody thought they were cute. But when they hit about 16 and 17, the way they got treated was vastly different. They went from cute to a threat, and they'll say things like, Pastor, we just we had no idea that it was this bad. And of course, I pastor them. We love them. And then I have to challenge them and say, how did you not know black Christians have been telling you this for decades? The reason why you didn't know is because the problem wasn't at your doorstep. Don't wait to care about justice until the problem is your doorstep. Think about it. Jesus in the eternal counsel of the Father and the Spirit didn't say, listen, I had nothing to do with their sin. We gave them a perfect world and they messed it up. Ain't my problem. I'm not going for them. But no, the Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Love demands, commands, and empowers us to be courageous. Love isn't sentimental. Love actually looks like the cross. I think that's a perfect place for us to end today. The name of the book is How to Heal Our Racial Divide, What the Bible Says and the First Christians Knew About Racial Reconciliation by Dewey Gray. Thank you, Dewey and Vicki, for joining us on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Maxwell and Stu podcast. Could you please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to this podcast and recommend it to others so that we can fulfill the Maxwell and Stu's mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints and their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and engage the world of religious ideas. Thank you and have a great week.